Good morning, how are you doing at the 8 a.m.? See, some people know how this thing works. I work on call and response. You know, when I get on stage, I don't just accept a low level of volume because it's an 8 a.m. I expect that you're going to give me something because I've got something for you. How is the 8 a.m. doing? There we go. I was just taken back to being like 14 years old, losing my mind in a mosh pit at youth, singing Pick It Up by Planet Shakers. I don't know, I was just having my own moment because, and now some people are like cheap as Duncans. You, you are young if you were 14 years old when Planet Shakers was big and Pick It Up was happening. But uh, it was good for me. I enjoyed it. I'm having a good morning. I don't know about you. And uh, I really am so happy to be up here and sharing God's word with you this morning. We're in a series called The Money Myth. And last week we kicked it off, Sai kicked us off, and uh, I've got a lot. I'm going to try and make this, this the shortest long preach I possibly can, and so I'm going to jump straight in. Is that okay? Sai last week really set us up and set a foundation coming into this series where we're looking at these myths that we have around the area of money and really taking a deeper look at what Jesus and God and his word has to say about it. And so last week we saw that Jesus actually talks about money a lot. I think people were shocked at just how much Jesus speaks about money and what he has to say to us. And one of the big truths that Sai brought out as he broke some of these myths around money was that God really cares so much about our money because it's actually his. He's the one who provided it, and so it matters what we do with it. He cares about how we handle it, how we save, how we spend, how we give. And he has so much to say to us in the area of money because we know that the desire, the love of money is dangerous. God's calling us to pursue him and not money, and so money can actually become the biggest rival to God as we are trying to pursue and seeking and serve him in every area of our life. But God has something to say. He says, hey, I am the one you should be pursuing. You can use money, but you can do it in the way I've called you to. And so coming into this week, we're going to be looking at uh, this message, part two, and it's called hashtag blessed. Last week, we saw Jesus as he talks. This week, we're looking at Jesus, how he blesses. And we're going to be taking a look at two very big topics, prosperity and poverty. It's going to be fun. I'm excited. Before we jump in, I just want to encourage you right now. Obviously, uh, last week's Sai ended on, a, on such an important verse in Matthew chapter 6 from the words of Jesus, where he said that actually where our treasure is, our heart will be also. And so when we're talking about something like money, which can be a hot button issue, we're going to be caring to the heart of our, the, our, to, we're going to go to our very own hearts. And when you start to hit heart issues, it sometimes can be uncomfortable. But it's my encouragement to all of us, as we are even challenged today, that there's a great opportunity for growth. Because don't miss that Jesus has a desire to speak to you and me today at a heart level. He has a better way to go about this. And I promise if you lean in, you'll be so blessed coming out of today. We're going to be looking today at two big myths, and the first one I'm going to jump straight into, and it's in this whole idea of rich versus poor, but the first myth is this, that God would favor one over the other, and within the side of prosperity and the other side of poverty, I believe there are a few lies that we believe, lies that have, that have taken root that we see evident within uh, what we believe as individuals and what we believe as a society. And so on the prosperity side, I think the big lie that has taken hold, and you will know this, it's the big lie of the prosperity gospel. That somehow we are now so favored that prosperity is the goal. We get it wrong. Some people walked in the door this morning and they heard the word prosperity and they cringed because they just knew this is the reality of what we're dealing with in terms of the things that are around us. Now, if you're not familiar with the prosperity gospel, I want you to know that it is a false gospel. That it is actually not what Jesus would have us believe about him and his salvation. And so it actually forms, it can lie on a spectrum. You'll have the most radical who will be very overt and say, the ultimate goal, the ultimate aim of God is that you would be materially rich. They're very open and honest about it. And often the justification that comes through is, well, we are now children of God. God is a king. So children of the kingdom shouldn't dress in poorly clothes. They should look like the king. 
all the way to the other side of the spectrum, which is quite light, where they may be, be a bit, uh, they'll be careful in their wording, but you will still see these hallmarks of the prosperity gospel where the uh, danger of sin gets minimized, and we're not going to talk about suffering or a trial of any kind because that doesn't play nicely with the message of prosperity. It's a spectrum. There's so much, and we see it around. If you looked at a prosperity preacher's script, it would start out with God's ultimate desire is that you would be blessed and you would be blessed financially. And so therefore, riches are the goal, so pursue it. Jesus is actually there to be followed in order to get material gain. Jesus is actually a means, not an end. That's what we heard about last week. And riches, material wealth, actually is the sign of God's ultimate blessing. This is what you would hear now, in and of itself, it is completely contradictory to the gospel of Jesus and what the New Testament has to say about him and how we relate to him. The truth is, it is a false gospel because it's taken one truth, one truth that we see in the gospel that we are blessed as believers, and it's twisted it to be solely about material wealth. It's completely forgotten about the eternal blessing that we have in salvation. It omits truths like the dangers and reality of sin and the effects it can have on our hearts and our lives. It won't talk about suffering and, and, and it does create ill-equipped Christians because they don't know what to do when, trials of, when the trials of life come at them. Because the only answer ever given is, well, there's a problem with your faith individually. It's not helpful. The truth is you'll never hear a prosperity preacher Preach on the words of Jesus when he says, hey, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus speaks of, hey, there's going to be some sacrifice in following me. There is going to be some surrender. I don't just want one part of your life. I want it all because I'm the one who created you. I know how this should be best set up. You're not going to find it in the script because this is not actually the gospel. This is a false gospel, a false teaching that's propelled by false teachers. There's two big reasons that I believe the prosperity gospel is so dangerous. Number one is this. The prosperity gospel would encourage that we love money and not love God. That we would love money and we would not love God. This is what it says in 1 Timothy 6 verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these things, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And here's the verse we hit last week. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Prosperity and riches so often can actually be a curse and not a blessing. Money is not the problem in and of itself. The love of money is. The desire of money is. And so we can get it so mixed up. I want you to hear me. It is not sin, sinful to be rich. It is not sinful to have a lot of money. But if money has become the thing we are pursuing, if our aim and our desire is to keep our money, to grow our money for our own sake, then we have missed what God has called us to and that's the difference. Second reason it's so dangerous is I don't want us to forget the prosperity preacher's target. The prosperity preacher's target is your wallet for money and not your soul for salvation. There's a big difference there. They'll go after a wallet for money and not go after a soul for salvation. It's dangerous because, and I don't have to tell you about this. You know, you've seen it. It's around us. You'll have prosperity preachers who will gather people. And it's not just those who are well off. Hey, you're rich. Let me help you be a bit richer. It's generally those who are poor, who are in desperate need, that get gathered in their hundreds and thousands. And they get baited with this truth of, hey, Jesus can make you financially rich. And they often will bring this uh, story in. Hey, well, you know what? If you want to get an apple tree, you need to use apple seeds. And so if you want to reap financial, financial gain, well, you're going to have to sow financially into this ministry. That's a truth you will hear prosperity preachers bring every week. And then they'll pack up and they'll get on their private jet and they'll move on to the next crowd. 
it's a dangerous place to be because everybody is a target. And the bait is Jesus can now make you rich. And that's actually his ultimate desire. They forget that the ultimate truth of the gospel, the ultimate truth of Jesus in his love for us is that not just we can be physically blessed, but that we can be spiritually blessed in eternity with him. That actually we have on offer to us a complete and whole relationship with Jesus where our sin has weighed up a, sin, a, a mountain of debt against us. And it actually can now be placed on him so that we are blessed not just now but in eternity as we are present with him forever. They miss out on so much. So much truth gets omitted. One truth gets blown up and gets twisted. And it is a false gospel. This might just be a bit of a sidebar, but I absolutely hate that right now the word prosperity has been so tainted that it's almost like we can't use it in church. It's almost like just me mentioning it will make people cringe, begin to grab pitchforks and shout heresy. I really do have a desire because prosperity is actually something the Bible talks about. It's actually a word you will find in the Bible a lot. And so it's my real hope and desire that we would redeem that word, understanding it in the truth that God has given. Because this is not a myth. This is actually true. Go read God's word. He does have a desire that you would prosper. He does have a desire to bless his people. He has got a desire that in your relationships you would prosper. He's got a desire that your family would prosper. He's got a desire that your business would be blessed. He has a desire that you would live a life that is full of his blessing. But his highest desire is that we would look like his son. His highest desire is in fact that our love and our affection would ultimately first in its in most highest intensity exponentially growing would be for him and him alone. Because we're actually called to love God and not money. So often we love money and use God, we're called to actually love God and use money. We need to get the order and the focus right. And I, I want us to be a people that can redeem this word, can redeem this idea, understanding it in the light of what Jesus has to say. It's really my thing. This is what I believe the prosperity gospel often forgets. When you look at prosperity in the Bible, you will always see two things happen. Number one, you will see it draw people into closer intimacy with God. Because now... If God is the focus and he comes through, he is now the provider who has brought provision. And so I want you to know that money is so powerful that in the kingdom of God, it actually can draw me and you closer in intimacy with God. When we get our focus right, when our focus is God and him as the provider, the provision doesn't become the main thing. He actually does because he is the, it's not about the blessing. It's about the one who brought the blessing. That's where our focus lies. And so it can draw us into a deeper relationship with God. It's what we see as we look at prosperity in the Bible. The second thing we'll also see is that God's people are always blessed to be a blessing. This is where prosperity preachers get it wrong because for them, it's just blessed to be blessed. And whatever else happens, that's extra. That's bonus. God always brings blessing to you so he can get blessing through you. And so he will bless you, not so that you simply are happy and blessed and, oh, Jesus loves me, this I know. It's actually, hey, this is how much he has loved me, but he's actually commissioned me to be a blessing to others. It's always been his pattern. It's always been how he has rolled because uh, prosperity in the Bible is never self-centered. It's always God-centered. This is what Jim Baker says. I love this quote. Prosperity doesn't mean that every Christian is going to be a millionaire. It does imply, however, that we should have finances proportionate to our assignments from the Lord and more than enough to be a blessing to others. That's what prosperity in the Bible would look like. That's actually what God is meaning. That's actually when he says, I've got a desire to bless you, what it actually would look like. That's the big lie of the prosperity gospel. Let's move to the other side and get into this idea of poverty. I think there's a big lie that has taken root on the side of poverty. And the big lie is this, that somehow poverty is especially spiritual. You'll see it through the kind of 19th, 20th centuries. It took hold in the church. It even took hold in secular society that somehow having nothing meant you were more spiritual than anyone. That somehow being uh, in poverty meant you were the elite in the spiritual realm. 
that somehow you understood God better, that somehow you actually were now living the life of a Christian as it was meant to be. That, and on the other side of it, actually being rich or having any sort of material wealth was evil. Because they forget that verse. They say, well, you know, money is the root of all evil. No, it's not. The love of money is the root of all evil. They get it wrong. They think it's especially spiritual. And you would sometimes hear things and they'll point back to, well, you know, Jesus on earth was always poor. He knew what poverty was. I agree with you 100%. Before that, after that, right now, he is sitting in all the prosperity of heaven. The truth is Jesus knows what it means to be poor. And Jesus knows what it means to be rich. He doesn't favor one or the other. It's not like one trumps the other in the kingdom of God. Because this is where we mess it up so bad. We draw a line and it's simply between those who are rich and those who are poor. But God draws a line and it's far higher, far superior. The line he draws is not between rich and poor. The line he draws is between godly and ungodly. That's the only line he draws. I want to take a look at the rich and poor in Scripture. There's four different types of them. Number one is the godly rich. Proverbs 10.22 says this, The blessing of the Lord brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. Wealth in and of itself is not sinful. You can be very rich materially and still be going after and pursuing the things of God. On the other side, you then get the ungodly rich. Proverbs 15, 27, whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household. I told you God cares about how we handle our money. So he cares about how we obtain it. And for so many who are rich, they've obtained it in ungodly ways. And it's saying something about what they're going after. They're ungodly rich. Third one is the godly poor. Proverbs 28, 6 says, better is a man who walks in his integrity, is a poor man that walks in his integrity, than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. Jesus understood what it meant to live in poverty while being completely 100% godly. It is possible to live this life on earth from the day you're born to the day you die in complete poverty and still be after the things of God, be pursuing him as your ultimate desire and find yourself in the space of being godly and poor. Last one, number four, the ungodly poor. Proverbs 10, 4 says, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. God makes it very clear that there are some who uh, fall because of the system, because something has happened to them, it's out of their control. But there are some who go down the path of ungodliness because they are lazy. They have done it to themselves. And the Bible wants you to know there are some people who are not victims. It's shown a heart issue. That actually at the core of who they are is laziness. And in God's kingdom, God doesn't call us to be lazy. He calls us to be diligent. And so because of laziness, they will find themselves in poverty. But by diligent hands, you can can make wealth. He wants to draw that line in the sand. Four types. You get godly and ungodly. You get rich and poor. But I want you to see this big truth that God is far less worried about how much money we have and far more worried about what we do with it. He's far more worried about how we handle it, how we manage it, and how we steward it. Because so often we get caught up in rich versus poor. His only focus is godly or ungodly. Now, I don't want this to be insensitive right now. Because I understand that there are so many who are struggling in this area. I want you to hear my heart. I wholeheartedly believe that with all the problems we have, with the lack we have, the needs we have, our answer is not to get more money. I believe we need more wisdom. Because if God cares about what we do with our money far more than how much money we have, I think we're, we're getting it wrong. And maybe if we're sitting in that space where we're in lack or in need, our prayer life maybe needs to change. Maybe we need to take a look at what God is saying. And instead of praying, hey, God, would you give me more money to fix this problem? Maybe start to pray, God, would you give me more wisdom to know what to do in this situation? Because the truth is God could give you more money and fix the problem, but it will fix the problem now, not tomorrow. Wisdom can help you today and tomorrow because wisdom comes from God. He will tell you what to do. He's far more worried about how we handle it, not how much of it we have. I believe that's where we can see real change. 
Now, I understand the reality of our world. I understand that there is inequality, that there's injustice, that there's financial oppression, financial slavery. The Bible is not quiet on this. It understands it. This is what Proverbs 22, 7 says. It says that the rich rule over the poor. I don't know if you know the golden rule. Those who have the gold make the rules. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is the slave to the lender. My whole premise is that we need more, more wisdom. We don't need more money. Because the truth is when we look at the situation of our world, when we look at the situation in our country, in our city, we need more wisdom. I'll give you an example, a real life practical example of where I believe we need more wisdom, not more money. Are you aware of the crushing debt that is in South Africa right now? I did some research. I'm going to hit you with some stats. First one, if you're an adult in South Africa, the average adult in South Africa has at any one time hanging over their head eight loans. Eight. Eight. That's average. Currently, South Africans are owing over 120 billion rand in credit card debt. That means the average adult in South Africa is sitting on their credit card with 16,481 rand owing. Generally, credit cards in South Africa are somewhere between 18 and 24%. That's dangerous. Over 10 million people in South Africa right now are sitting in, in what is known as bad debt, meaning they have defaulted on pa monthly payments three or more months. 10 million people. And this was the scariest one for me. The average uh, ho household in South Africa, middle of the road, average household, is spending between 63 and 68 percent of their after-tax income repaying debt. That means nearly 70 percent of your income is just going to service debt. And then you're expected to do everything else. And then we're expected to survive suddenly when our kid gets sick, suddenly when the roof falls in, suddenly when something comes up that's unexpected. And so many people are sitting in this space where they're under this crushing weight. I know right now in a room this size, there are people who that's your story. And I want you to know, God doesn't need to give you more money to sort that out. He actually wants to give you more wisdom so that you can deal with it. Because, I mean, this is a community we care about you. We care about where you are. We care about helping you take steps. And so even in this area, if you're sitting in that spot, sitting under that crushing weight, we want to help you. It's why we will have things like the finance initiative, because we have got guys who are expert, who are willing and able to help you in this area. And I want to encourage you, if you're in that, if, in that zone, if you're sitting with problems of debt, if you're sitting with financial issues, if you're young and you haven't stepped into this yet, I want you to get to the finance initiative so you set up this thing right. I promise you, you get this right, you'll be 10 years ahead of your mates. I wish I could go more into this. I just don't have time to. But the four things I want to say to you, if you're sitting in that space, is number one, ask for help. There is no shame in it. I understand some people just want to be ostriches, put their head in the sand. If you're dealing with debt, that's not the way to do it. Stop it now. The damage has been done. Don't let any more damage come in. Ask for help. We've got ways to help you. We've got people who are willing and able to help you. The second thing I want to say is uh, don't go any further. You might have a mountain of debt the size of Mount Kilimanjaro right now. So many people will take out debt to pay a debt. If you stop right now, that thing won't turn into Everest. Let the damage that's been done be the only damage that is done. Third thing is, there may be some change that needs to come. You might need to restructure things. You might actually need to uh, budget differently. You might actually need to restructure how you're doing this whole thing. But it's going to take consistency to get out. You're not going to get out in one day. It's going to take one step at a time. And it's my encouragement to you right now. If you're sitting looking at the elephant, wondering how am I going to eat this thing, how do you do it? One bite at a time. But it's going to be consistency. Proverbs 10 said it. Diligent hands bring wealth. I also believe diligent hands can get you out of debt to the point of zero where you now can actually make wealth. And so consistency will be important. It will happen one step at a time. So what do we do? 
What do we do about this poverty problem? What is the answer to the problem of poverty? I, I hope you've been hearing this. I don't believe it is governance. I don't believe it's some sort of economic structure. I don't believe the answer is more money. I actually believe that the answer to poverty lies in the good news of Jesus. Because when you drill down deeper and you look at poverty, what you will know, even secular society has worked this out. Poverty is, is actually a mindset. Because it deals with the issues of identity and purpose. It's why you'll have lotto winners who win the lotto, two years later are broke, and they're in a worse financial position than they were before the big money hit. It's actually a mindset. Because when you don't know who you are, when you don't understand value, then you don't know what to do, and you can't walk in the ways of wisdom. And so it's a mindset that needs to be dealt with. And the gospel has answers for those root issues. Not just, hey, there's a problem with money, let's chase it, let's throw it in. It actually goes after the root, the issues of identity and purpose. Because in Jesus, there is an answer for who you are. He perfectly made you. He knows how you are wired. He knows exactly how you, how you have been set up. And he also has all the wisdom of, uh, of heaven to give to you so that you know what to do. Because money doesn't work in the kingdom like it does in the world. So often we'll see a money problem and think, well, there's a lack of money. Let's throw money at it to fix it. That's not how God would sort out the issue. Because money in Jesus' kingdom isn't pursued, it's attracted. There's a truth there that I don't think we get. It is not pursued, it is attracted. That's why Jesus says, love God, not money. Because when you love God, when you go after him, he'll tell you who you are, he'll tell you what to do, and he'll bring provision and resource to it. I believe the answer to the, pub, the problem of poverty is a godly vision. A godly vision, that's a two-step process. Because true vision is going to involve pursuing the presence of God. Because as we get into the presence of God, He'll tell us who we are. He'll tell us what to do. He will actually awaken in us a vision. And one thing I know about how the kingdom of God works, about what he has to say in his word is this, that where there is vision, provision will follow. So often we go after provision and we forget that we need vision. Jesus is saying, hey, chase the vision. Chase me. Spend time with me. Get into my presence. I'll tell you who you are. I'll tell you what to do. And I'll bring resource to that. Chase God and his vision and his plan and watch how he will then provide. We go about it the wrong way. That's myth number one. Myth number two. This is a big one. And we're going to spend most of our time here. Myth number two is this, that God is fair. It's a big one. And it might hit you sideways. I actually had this conversation with my uh, city group that me and my wife, Nikita, lead, and it absolutely destroyed brains because you, it sounds right. Surely God should be fair. Surely when we're talking about the economics of our world, it's going to be met by a fair God. Maybe not. I want to take you to a, a passage in Matthew chapter 20, and it's Jesus speaking. He had been teaching large crowds, and then he encountered the rich young ruler that we heard about last week, and then his disciples begin to question him about his kingdom how it works, how economics will work in his kingdom. And he shocks them with this parable. It's a story, if you don't know, a parable is always a story that uses earthly things to communicate heavenly realities. And his intention and his motivation is, hey, this is how I work. This is how I rule. This is how I interact. This is how I act. And it's different to what you think. Matthew chapter 20, you can turn with me there. Or follow along with me up on the screen. It's quite a chunk, but it's, sto it's a story, so I think we'll all be okay. This is what it says. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with, laborers, uh, with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went, going out again about the seventh, sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, last hour of the day, he went out, found others standing, and he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. 
And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers, pay their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at their master, at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. I love this master. He replies to them, friend, have you ever had that moment where someone is so hyped and so angry and you just hit them with something super passive and friendly? And it just, like, it, it's amazing. Like they're all hype. Ah, and then, hey, friend, it's the best thing to take out of, like the wind out of someone's sails. Like I've done it where like someone's been like road raging against me and you just be really nice and you give them a compliment and they just don't know what to do. But that's, sorry, that's cyber. I'm getting track. Um, Master replies to them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. Quick recap. You have a master of a vineyard. I don't want to shock you. Jesus is the answer. So that's actually God. Shock. Just if you, if you missed it, it's talking about God and his kingdom. There's a master of a villain who now begins to hire workers. And so he hires five groups at different times of the day. The very first group, that would be the first hour of the day, probably around about 6 a.m. They go the normal way. They get a contract. They get an agreement. You will get a day's wage for a day's labor. It makes sense. You then have three groups in the middle where there's no agreement. He just says, hey, go in, work, I'll give you what is right. Again, he says what is right, not what is fair. Notice that. And then the last group, the 11th hour, probably around about 5 p.m., he says, right, last hour, don't worry, you guys just go in. No agreement, nothing. Just go in and do it. And then 6 p.m. comes, 12 hours later, whole day, whole shift gone. Payment time comes. And he tells his foreman, I want you to pay them Last to first. And so the last get a denarius. They'd only worked one hour, but they get a full day's wage. First group gets excited, thinks, oh, well, I'm going to get more. Surely I work 12 hours. They don't. Next group gets a denarius. Next group, denarius. Next group, denarius. They get a denarius. And they're working. They, you can see Jesus, like I care about two things, Jesus and maths. These guys did too. They were like, math doesn't make sense here. That guy worked one hour. I worked 12, but he's getting the same as me. Surely that is not fair. Do you know what? They had a point. But the bigger point Jesus is making is saying in my kingdom, in my vineyard, in how I rule, in how I work, the big truth is I don't deal in fairness. That might shake you, that might rock you, but let me explain it a bit more. Wait a minute, you, you might be, I get it, you might be sitting there going, Dunks, are you telling me in the inequality of our world, it's not going to be dealt with by a fair God? This parable, what Jesus is sharing, is telling us no. Don't get me wrong, God cares for those who are in need. God cares for those who are in lack. God actually despises and will come against any form of oppression or tyranny. He does not deal in inequality or injustice. He actually will make those things right. But the truth the Bible is wanting us to know is that God is actually not fair, but God is always just. And there's a difference. Because in fairness versus justice, what you will see in fairness is it's all about sameness. In justice, it's always about rightness. This is how it plays out. It's similar to the idea, the difference between equality and equity. Because in fairness and equality, everyone is treated the same no matter what. In justice and equity, everyone is treated differently toward the same outcome. And so fairness is all about input focus. What we're putting in, everyone gets the same. In justice, it's actually outcome focused. Hey, there's the goal, there's the aim. We're gonna treat everyone uniquely because they're unique in their space. Treat them differently in order to get them to the same outcome. It's very different. It's not how we would normally go about it. And I want you to know that God never actually claims to be fair. Go look through scripture. 
Go look what he has said about himself, what is revealed in the life of Jesus. It will never talk about sameness. His claim is that I am holy, that I am loving, that I am good, that I am just, and that I will always do right. I'm not about sameness. Just take a look at his creation. Take a look at the makeup of the people in this room, and you will know that our God is not about sameness. That's not how he deals. That's not how he works. If God is not fair, I wonder what Jesus is wanting to say to us through this parable. There's four things I really want to highlight that you may have missed as we went through this parable. The first thing I want to highlight is the hiring. You get five groups with different approaches to hiring. The first group actually are the only ones who get an agreement, the only ones who get a contract. And what he says is, hey, uh, you will work a whole day and get a day's wage. Agreed, contract, legally binding, done. You then get three groups in the middle. There's no formal agreement. All there is is, hey, go in, I'll give you what's right. Last group, absolutely nothing, totally informal, gun ho just go in. Last hour, it doesn't matter. Three different approaches. Because God approaches different people differently. But his goal is toward the same outcome, that you would be in my vineyard that you would be within the gate. That's his desire. That's what he's going after. That trumps everything for him. And so he will act differently with different people. Second thing is his timing. I don't want you to forget the vineyard is open all day. Every hour it was open. He's going after even to the 11th hour it is open. So God won't just go after the first group and say, do this this way. He actually does give us the opportunity to come in in our own time. He understands that for some, the invitation needs to come later. We have some journeying to do along the way. Third thing I want to talk about is payment. This one's huge. This was a very unorthodox situation, very unorthodox. These were Jewish day laborers. There was a legal process, a normal protocol that would be followed, and the master goes against it. Normally what would happen is you would pay before sunset so the master wouldn't run away and not pay in the shadow of darkness. But he tells the foreman, I want you to pay them last to first. That's normally not how it went. Naturally, those who arrived first would be paid first. Those who arrived last would be paid last. He goes against him. And it's funny because the conflict would have been avoided if he went about it the normal way. The first group would have got paid their denarius. They would have been on their way. And they would have never known what the last group got. So I believe the master was very intentional. He was wanting them to see this moment. He was wanting them to see, hey, this is different. This is actually how I work. The guys who worked one hour, they're going to get the same as you. He goes after it. And I think what Jesus is letting us in on is, hey, I do this thing differently, so don't be shocked when you get frustrated. Don't be shocked when you don't understand, because that leads into the fourth point. I believe there was a different value system here at work. What they were placing in terms of value versus what the master was placing in terms of value was very different. To them, they said, my 12 hours is more than that guy's one. What the master says, and quite rightly, he goes after them and says, I agreed with you, a day's wage for a day's labor. Legally binding contract, no wrong. You did the work, I gave you the pay, we agreed upon it, there's no wrong. But your focus is here on what I've given to this last group. Can I not do with what is mine what I want? And even more than that, goes beyond it and says, and actually, do you re- are you so irritated by this that you actually want to go against my generosity to this thing? Because this is the thing. When we desire sameness so often, it only matters to us when we benefit. And when we feel shortchanged, it's going to get us angry. It's going to get us frustrated. What the master did for the last group was actually a very gracious, loving, generous thing. And when we go after sameness, so often we can miss the beauty of how God works. I want you to know this. Jesus ends this parable and he draws our attention to the two groups, the two extremes. First group and last group as the band joins me on stage. As he goes after it, he's saying, I need you to know there's a first group and there's a last group. And the way you would go about it is first, first, last, last. The way I go about it is last, first, first, last last. It's different. And I don't know where you are right now, even as we've gone through this, but which group do you identify with? 
Because on the one side, you have uh, the last group. They had come in an hour. They, they, they rocked up at 5 p.m., they left at 6, and they got a full day's wage. Do you know how happy those oaks would have been? I guarantee they were coming back tomorrow at 5 p.m. Like, that's where they were. But maybe, the truth is, and I'm being honest, I know it's a bit, general, a bit of a generalization, but I truly believe there will be less of us that identify with that group. I think the majority of us will identify with the first group, the ones who are frustrated, the ones who have tried to do this thing right, who came in early, who seek to do a good day's work, who, ju- who want to serve well, who really have put all, in all the effort, who suffered the heat of the day, and now we feel like actually this is unfair. We're disheartened. We, we're struggling with what's happening here. So many of us will identify there will be that group. Here's what I want you to know. The problem with this group was its approach because how it related to the master was by the law. There was a legal agreement. Can I tell you, if we relate to God by the law, we will come unstuck. And it's no wonder we will go down a road of being angry and frustrated because it's not how it was meant to be. Notice that through the groups, the agreement, the formal, the legal system got less and less. And the disposition of the groups got more and more positive. Do you know why? It's because when the law moves out, grace moves in. That last group got a full day's wage for an hour's labor. Those, that last group left just being happy to be in the room. Because they understood the grace and generosity of the master. It wasn't by what they had done, by what they had earned. It was simply because they were sitting under the blessing of the master. He had a choice to do with what was his, what he wanted, and they benefited. We can never relate to God under the law, otherwise we'll just be frustrated. We can only relate to God under grace and get to the place where we are just happy to be in the room, where we're just happy to get in the gate, where we're just happy to be in the vineyard, and sit under the blessing of the master. Why don't you stand with me? I know there's been a lot that I've thrown at you this morning. One thing that God just had dropped in my heart right from the beginning was that the struggle is real. I don't know what your struggle is right now. Your struggle might be actual financial issues right now. You're sitting under that weight. Your struggle might be actually in how you're relating to God because you've just been relating to Him through the law and it's led you down a road of frustration and it's not been through grace. Or maybe you've just struggled in your understanding of how God works, in how He deals in His kingdom, in how He rules, in how He reigns. I want you to know in this area of money, He's wanting to highlight, I do this thing differently. But if you would put your faith and trust in me, if I would be the number one thing you pursue, if I am first in everything, I will pull everything back into line. Because it's in that space that you will actually find my blessing. Take a moment right now. I just want every eye closed. What was speaking to you? What struggle was God going after? What was he revealing to you? What spoke to your heart and your situation right now? I believe there's some in here who have been praying and praying and praying that God would just bring more money and more resource. It's my prayer that he would bring wisdom, that he would bring revelation of who you are and how you should work in his kingdom because that changes everything. In that, there is no problem of poverty. In that, there is no problem of prosperity. There is just God as our focus, the one who provides, the one who blesses, and the one who even lovingly will correct us when we stray. Father God, I want to pray right now, even as we're about to sing, that you are our way maker, that you are our promise keeper that our eyes right now, our perspective would be lifted to you, that our focus would be on you. Lord, where we have thought wrong, would you bring it back into alignment? Where there is a crushing weight because we don't understand who we are and so we don't know what to do. Lord, I pray right now you would bring clarity. 
I pray that tangibly, tangibly your presence would be felt. Because Lord, as we pursue your presence, you will unlock vision. And Lord, where you go with vision, you will bring provision. Lord, we want to be a people who go after you as the king of the kingdom. We don't want to work like the world would. We don't want to go about fixing the problems of the world as the world would try to do it. We want to grab a hold of the wisdom of heaven, of the power of God to enter into situations and completely change them. Lord, I pray for those who are sitting disheartened right now, those who are down low, who are feeling weak. Would you raise them up? Would you actually comfort those right now who have got these things that are hitting so deep in the heart? Lord, as we sing, as we worship, as we lift you up, would you be made much of? Would you, would you get so big that everything else would get quite small and dim? That even when there's problems, even when there's circumstance coming against, they would grow small because we see a big God. We serve a big God. Lord, we want to be all about you, people who pursue you. We want to love God and not money. And so, Lord, would you do a work in our heart, even in this moment? Let's sing together.